So we're going to talk about language, and I'm actually going to keep it pretty short. And then we will take some questions, hopefully, on languages, if people have any questions. Uh, putting things in reverse, I, to reiterate what I said earlier, I was never good at languages. I never considered myself good at languages until I was forced to learn Japanese in a very unorthodox way as an exchange student, because I did not have really structured formal classes. So it was comic books, judo textbooks, so forth and so on. And as I refined this approach, Japanese took about 11 months to become you know, functionally fluent in reading, writing, uh, speaking. The next time I applied that and refined the approach, Mandarin Chinese, and that took about six months. Again, reading, writing, speaking. Then about three months for German when I was living in Berlin. And then I took my old nemesis, which was Spanish, which had defeated me right, for many years. <laughs> and then took eight weeks in Argentina to get to the most advanced level for Spanish uh, at the University of Buenos Aires. So this is a recipe that you can apply. And ultimately, you know, the four-hour chef, as it applies to food, to cooking, to skills, to life, to survival, whatever, there are recipes for all these things. So I'm going to share a few things that I've learned, and we will go from there. They all, what this approach has in common with, let's say, the four-hour body, four-hour work week, few things. The minimal effective dose. So just like taking antibiotics, too little doesn't get the job done. You're not speaking a language, let's say in this case. Too much, and it takes 20, 30 years. Just the right dose, and you get exactly the highest ratio of sort of benefits to side effects. Sometimes those side effects are social, right? You can't spend five hours studying a language a day if you have a family, a full-time job, etc. cetera. Uh, other things, 80-20 analysis. So we talked about vocabulary. And if you choose the right 1,000 to 1,200 words properly, then you can be functionally fluent, express almost any idea in any language in a very short period of time, eight to 12 weeks. And that is possible through different mnemonic devices, which we'll talk about. Mnemonic, uh, Nemesine, god of, goddess of memory. Mnemonic is a memory trick or mechanism that you can use to absorb more information and take unfamiliar items like vaca in Spanish, let's say, and convert it into like vacuum, sounds similar, and you see a cow with a with a, like a face as a vacuum, let's say. And that's the way that you create the proper sequence so that Q, cow, vacuum, vaca, right? And by doing that, you can absorb, say, 100 to 300 words a day pretty easily in a Romance language like Spanish. Okay, well, if we have a target of 1,200 words, you know, four to 10 days, and you have all the vocabulary you need to express yourself in a foreign language, it's pretty cool. So when people tell you, you know, it takes 20 years to become good at a language, not true. Uh, when people say it takes a lifetime to, be, to sound like a, a native speaker. No, it doesn't. To become a, someone who appears fluent, sounds fluent 90 plus percent of the time, really only takes a few months. But you have to go about it intelligently. So grammar can be very intimidating for people. And uh, this is, this is a, a collection of 12 sentences that uh, I've used to deconstruct different languages. So if you remember, we talked about earlier, there's this dis process for uh, addressing any skill, breaking it down, learning it quickly. So you have deconstruction, selection, sequencing, and then stakes. Okay, right here we have 12 sentences and then an optional 13th, and I'll explain these very briefly. So <coughs> we will first give an illustration of uh, Cardinal Mezzofanti, perhaps the most famous language learner of all time. So he was called a hyper polyglot. Polyglot, speak multiple languages, hyper polyglot. So depending on who you ask, anywhere from 30 to 72 languages. Pretty awesome. And he could fool speakers of very, very uh, seldom spoken or archaic languages. Give him a week and he would, he would knock it out. He always started with the Lord's Prayer. He would have them translate the Lord's Prayer into their language because in the Lord's Prayer, he could then pick out indirect objects, direct objects, how the grammar was structured. So in that one paragraph, you know, one or two paragraphs, he would then have the entire language represented. And that is the minimal effective dose. Okay, so in the same way, grammar of any language. So if I'm sitting on a plane, you know, God forbid you speak a language that I don't, you're probably gonna end up having me ask you about these questions. Uh, so I've done this with Russian, you know, learning to read Cyrillic on an airplane ride, and it's not because I'm good at it, it's because I have an approach. So here we have, the apple is red. You know, it is John's apple, possessive, right? I give John the apple. John, that is a direct 
the, being given the apple, right? We give him the, the apple. So then we have sort of pronoun here, the apple. So whether it's Spanish, German, Japanese, you get to see how they're structured differently. He gives it to John. So here we have that it, right? She gives it to him, like le lo se lo in Spanish, okay? Is the apple red? Question mark. So in different languages, when you, may, when you ask a question, the word order can change. Or like in Japanese, you have it goes from like des to des ka. You have a ka at the end for a question. That's a question mark. The apples, plural, are red, right? So is it like el chico, los chicos? Or is there some other tweak that makes it into a plural? And these are all very simple sentences. I want to give it to her. I'm going to know tomorrow. I can't eat the apple. Uh, and we're going to come to these. These are very important. The must, want, I'm going, I can't. These are super important. I have eaten the apple, and I'm not going to delve into like, the, the, the details, into the weeds of the grammar, but I have eaten the apple. Once you have I have, the verb to have, like tener in Spanish, uh, you can say, or like habe for the first person in German. Then you can say I have eaten, I have gone. And it saves you the trouble of conjugating all of those verbs. OK. So basically, with 13, with 13 sentences, you know, 12 sentences, you can get a very firm grasp of the fundamentals of any grammar. Okay? Uh, so how do you kickstart? We, this is nine languages. This is a, uh, a table from the 4-Hour Chef. But kickstarting nine languages with four sentences. So I mentioned there are a few things like I must eat, I want, I'm going, I can't. So I must, or like uh, I want, these would be referred to as helping verbs. Okay? So let's say you have 1,000 verbs. You're, and you're trying to learn Spanish, and they're like, congratulations, here's like a thousand verbs in Spanish. And you get this huge phone book, and you open it up, and it's just like graphs and graphs and graphs of conjugations. It's terrible. It's horrible. That's why you quit. That's why I quit. Instead, uh, the, the approach of, let's say, Michelle Thomas, M-I-C-H-E-L Thomas, who was a Holocaust survivor, then an intelligence officer, became very famous for acquiring languages quickly. And the way he teaches his students, he has some fantastic audio recordings you can get on Amazon, by the way, but get his recordings, his live recordings. He would take a few words, uh, I must eat, he must eat, she must eat, they must eat. This eat is the infinitive of the verb. So let's say to eat, comer, right? Instead of like, como, I eat, you don't have to conjugate it. So tengo que comer, I have to eat, you have to eat, tienes que comer. She has to eat, he has to eat, tiene que comer. You avoid conjugating all of these verbs. You're only conjugating four or five verbs. So you'll learn four or five verbs, which you can do in an afternoon. You can use any verb in the language, OK? And what's really cool about that is, all right, I have to, I have to eat. All right, fine. You know, I have to go, tengo que ir. OK. I have to sleep, tengo que dormir. Right? Really, really straightforward. I want to eat, quiero comer. Now, I want to point out something underneath. So you see these translations. They're a little weird. The way that I like to translate when I'm translating is not from Spanish to, say, native English. It's an approach that you see in a, a book series originally out of France called Asimil, A-S-S-I-M-I-L, where you have one word is then translated with hyphens. So you know that's one word. I have is tengo. I have. Que, that, comer, to eat. I have that to eat. So you're putting in a bridge between English and this, this target language so that as you start to think about, like, I have to eat, I have to go, it's I have that to go. OK, that's easy. Tengo que ir. Right? And same story, voy a comer ma mañana. Right? So instead of learning, let's say, you know, comeré, like uh, uh, a, f a present, I'm sorry, a future tense conjugation, voy a. So all you're learning is like, voy, vas, va, van. Super straightforward. Uh, then I'll, I'll point out a few things here. Why this becomes really important, these translations. So, no puedo comer. So, I cannot to eat. Kind of similar to English, right? But then you have, uh, you have other examples, like Japanese. All right. To eat, thing, cannot. Kind of weird. Right? So, English is like Chinese. It's subject, verb, object. I eat the apple. I go to the library. Japanese is flipped around a little bit. So it's I, the apple, eat, right? Um, but by, by translating it this way, you actually learn to bridge, again, between those very odd 
uh, or I should say diametrically opposed ways of translating. So, taberu koto, taberu is to eat, koto is thing, ga, which is like a subject marker, dekinai. Dekinai is I cannot or cannot. Dekinai dekiru is, is I can, right? And you'll notice taberu, right? Ashita taberu, tomorrow to eat. So, what do you notice here? To eat, I eat, I eat tomorrow, and this doesn't change. Taberu, right? It's indicated by ashita, right? And then, <coughs> Want to eat has a conjugation at the end, but this is a very important example. Don't worry, I'm not going to make your brains melt by doing this for like a half hour. The <clears throat> in Japanese, you could say, uh, "I have to eat," right? I must eat. You could taberu. You could conjugate it. You could conjugate it. You could say something like "tabe nakereba naranai." That's freaking long. That's really long. A lot of syllables, you know, <laughs> hard to remember. And uh, the way you get around that is you use something that is slightly less native, okay, but it is perfectly grammatical and makes sense. In that case, you say, like, I have the necessity to eat, basically, right? Doesn't sound as weird in Japanese as it sounds <laughs> in English necessarily. Taberu hitsuyo ga aru. Okay, so taberu, to eat, necessity, there is, right? And by translating these, you start to figure out, okay, taperu hitsuyo ga aru. Aru is to exist. It's like, to eat, necessity, subject marker, there is. Same thing that we have here. To eat, thing, I cannot. All right? And this is all you need. So effectively, in two pages, you're able to deconstruct an entire language and gain access to thousands of verbs. And that's kind of the starting point. Where, where I recommend, this is the starting framework. Before you do this, what I recommend is getting, let's say, a Lonely Planet phrase book, or you could get the, the Vizad fl uh, flashcards. Flashcards, those sound intense. Flashcards <laughs> <laughs> that I talked about before. <laughs> so vis-ed.com. And learn 20 to 40 set phrases. All right? Uh, and what you'll notice is if you just learn to say, like, good evening, good morning, how are you, nice to meet you, etc., in a given language, after you just read through even these examples, you start to look at languages completely differently. And then you'll pick out grammar from the set patterns, right? So I went to Turkey, for instance, went to Istanbul, and uh, spent some time learning phrases. And they would say, like, uh, like, good evening, right? And I was like, so how does that translate literally, though? Not like, good evening. Like, what does it mean in Turkish? What do those words mean? And it's kind of like, and I might be screwing this up, it's been a while since I spoke any Turkish, but good evenings. İ akşamlar. Lar is the plural, not for everything. But you have like, I think it's kokuk, it's like child, and kokuk lar is children, right? It's like, ha, huh, interesting. So I started memorizing these set phrases. I was there for about 10 days and went through this, learned maybe a very bare minimum of like 300 words. Like very easy, just like a couple a day, you know whatever it was, 50 a day, which you can do in like two hours, really. It's just throughout, spread throughout the day. <clears throat> and on my way back to the U.S., I was able to stop, I think I had a connecting flight in Frankfurt, and there was a Rosetta Stone kiosk. And uh, Rosetta Stone's expensive, a couple hundred bucks for each like, packet of, of CDs, DVDs, et cetera. And uh, looked at it for a minute, and I was like, do you mind if I try your, your level three test? She's like, oh, you've been studying Turkish for a while. I'm like, yeah, long time. And uh, I, mean, I don't know what that is. A year later, after you finish you know, number three, and just by doing this, I was able to score above 85% on the level three test. So not only did I save months and months of time, I saved hundreds and hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars potentially over time. So that's about it. I think that is probably all I want to say about language. So let's see if there are any questions about language. I know it can seem like a very daunting subject. Uh, if you were, let's just say, going to tackle Spanish. So in the U.S., very, very helpful to know Spanish in many states. You can use it all day long in many places. What I would recommend, Michelle Thomas. No note-taking, no homework. Get his recordings of learning Spanish, where he's actually teaching two students live who do not speak a word of Spanish. And you follow along. So there's actually a pause for you to answer as the third student. You don't have to write anything. It's great. Start with that, and he uses a very similar framework with the helping verbs and things like that. Uh, then the, the Vized flashcards, uh, actually a new tool, Duolingo, is really outstanding. It's a free website that you can use. And uh, then I would focus on like 20 to 40 set phrases. 
once you've gotten through that, which takes maybe a week, week and a half, and like have fun with it. So it's like if you like comic books, read some comic books. I used a comic book called One Piece. It's a Japanese comic book. Uh, and I went to bookstores for each language. Like in any major city in the US, you can find Japanese bookstore, Spanish bookstore. Da, da, da, da, da. So I had One Piece, volumes one to six, in all the languages that I wanted to learn. Spanish, German, Japanese, etc. And then when I would learn one, I would, instead of using English as my reference, like if I missed something in the German, I would then go back and look, look at, let's say, the Japanese version. And that's how you learn multiple languages. So I'm using each language I learn to learn the next, if that makes sense. But have fun with it. So watch, watch movies, et cetera. Uh, any questions about language learning? We do have a question in the audience. You can yeah. stand up, Anjali. Yeah. Hi, I just had a question about pronunciation. How do you tackle pronunciation? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you seem very fluent in, in Japanese. I'm. Indian, at least my parents are, and I just remember growing up, I couldn't say certain sounds because they don't exist in English, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, they still make fun of me, so <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to know. Yeah. Uh, there, there is a good way. There are better ways to do it. So the, the, uh, I'll give an example of Chinese because that's a tough one for a lot of English speakers. Basically, how easy it is for certain people to learn languages is dependent upon the number of sounds they've been given with their native language, right? So people make fun of Japanese people all the time because they're like... You know, I like to go to, and it's like, it's not their fault is the sad thing. They just got screwed in like the sound lottery. <laughs> they got a really small set of phonemes. And so it's tough for them to learn certain languages, but not Spanish, because pronunciation is really similar. They always end on vowels, almost always, right? The best way to go about it, I think, is the way that uh, Chinese 101 goes about it at Princeton. And when I went to China the summer after my first year of, of Mandarin, became clear how ineffective most teaching of pronunciation is. Right? Like listening to yourself, how's that gonna help? If you can't get it the first time, how the hell are you gonna correct yourself, right? So what I would suggest is you could, you could use many different sites. Uh, you could use Craigslist to find someone, but find a native speaker like Live Mocha or uh, Verbling, I think is another one, and have a text. And my recommendation is rather than using like a newspaper article or something, write out your, your, your bio, like a five minute self introduction. You know, my younger brother is this old and lives in blah, blah, blah, and blah, blah, blah, and I went to this and I graduated from this. Because guess what? That bio is going to be 90% of what you talk about when you meet every single person and speak in that language. So you will seem really good if you have that stuff nailed, right? So if I'm like, mi hermanito, blah, blah, blah, and they're like, ooh, hermanito, oh, look at that, oh, that guy's Spanish is amazing. It's like, no, I just memorized my self-intro. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you get that, that self-introduction and say Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, whatever. Have it translated so it's natural. And then read that and record it. And then you send that to a native speaker who also has the same text. And they will circle or otherwise highlight the sounds and things that you have trouble with. And then you go through and you drill the hell out of those. Over and over and over. And then you read it again. And then you just rinse and repeat. And we had to do this every week in the language lab at Princeton. See, I think it's one of the few reasons that the students uniformly had the best pronunciation when we went to China. Because pronunciation is not a nice to have thing. It depends on the language. Like you, you mess up, you know, if you're, you know, Bloomberg and you massacre Spanish and you're like, El Storm is coming oh, to New York, you know. <laughs> it's like you can kind of get away from it. Yeah, or get away with it, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, oh truck coming, oh, you know, like people will let you get away with it in Spanish. In Chinese, if you mess up your tones. Forget it. Like, you know, ma is like mother. Ma is marijuana. Ma is to scold. Uh, uh, ma, is second tone, is, is marijuana. Ma is horse. Ma is to scold. So it's like, you mess that up, you could really get punched in the face. Or just not understood at all. Uh, so having a set text, and then reading it, recording it, providing it to someone, and then having them review it and circle the items that you have trouble with is by far, in my experience, the, the best approach. And you might think like, oh, we'll do it in real time. No, don't do it in real time. Because nine times out of ten, people will be too polite to interrupt you, or they'll, they'll wait until the end, and they'll only remember one thing you said wrong. So I actually like the asynchronous approach more than the real time. Real time is helpful if you have like two or three things that are really hard. Like second tone in Chinese is hard for a lot of people to hit. Then you need a super militant teacher. And uh, not, it's not always the case that a native speaker is the best teacher. This is, this is something that's really important. So like in the four hour shelf, I talk about 
being the best versus becoming the best, right? Like, do you want to learn from Michael Phelps or do you want to learn to swim from someone like Shinji Takeuchi who didn't know how to swim until like 30 something and then now is the second most viewed swimming technique video on YouTube? Maybe the second because he's going through exactly what you are going through or he has been through what you're going through, right? Uh, so the, the, the head instructor for Chinese 101 was white dude, non-Chinese, Perry Link. And his Chinese was so good that it made native speakers like, what? oh man, like, <laughs> this is embarrassing. And, but he had absolutely no mercy for people who were learning language. He was like, I've been through it. Don't expect any sympathy from me. And so I just remember once, this is just a quick story. So <laughs> Chinese 101, we had like eight classes a week. It was just brutal. And we started off with like 60 bright-eyed, bushy-tailed students who were like, I want to learn Chinese. And like within a week and a half, it was down to like 12 students. And I remember one class, a huge snowstorm, everyone had canceled classes except for Chinese 101. So like trudging through the snow to class, 8 a.m. or whatever, and we get in there. And one girl was really sick, just like a strep throat or something. She was like, Rawr. And <clears throat> so the routine was come in and be like, okay, xi, which is a really hard sound. Like, yi, and like all that like yi type stuff, or like, na shi, shama shi, ching. Like a retro flex is really hard for native English speakers. And so we did some sound. And he's like, she, and he's like, okay, you know, zalai. and everybody's like, she, and she was like, she, and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> one more time, you know, in, in Chinese, spoke the, spoke the entire time pretty much in Chinese. And she's like, she, and he's like, you know, whatever her name was, you know, fei you chong, you know, <laughs> you again, you know, and she was just like, she, she. and he's like, brutal, just like, it was, he was like the, the drill sergeant in full metal jacket, but for Chinese, you know, and, uh, but at the end of the day, they were all good. Anyway, long answer to a short question, but the pronunciation is super, super critical. Yeah. Well, this is so cool to talk about this, yeah. and if people want more information about this and yeah. kind of extending further yeah. about what you're talking about here with the languages, yeah. is your book, your upcoming book, Four Hour Chef. Yeah, the Four Hour Chef is, uh, I know. So, Chef, I use, this is actually a good time. So, Chef, I talk about what I mean by Chef. And I'm not just talking about cook versus chef, like someone who can make dishes versus run a kitchen or whatever it is. So chef, I'm talking about in the sense of like jefe, like boss or head from Latin, like being self-reliant, so you're a director in your own life instead of a spectator. And part of that is becoming a world-class learner. So if people want extended information about language learning, and it's a choose your own adventure book, so you don't have to get into it. If you want to skip around, fine. But I cover exactly how I tackled all of these different languages and the recipe that you use in the four hour chef. 